Our guest is former Watergate prosecutor Leon Jaworski, and like a lot of the rest of us, he was watching the Nixon Frost interviews during this past week. Let me ask you first, Mr. Jaworski, before we get into the substance of what was said, whether you see anything improper or objectionable about um, this treatment of history on a commercial basis, his treatment. Well, of course, uh, I would have preferred that immediately after his resignation that he have made a statement to the American people, which uh, I would have liked to have seen embody some of the matters that I'm personally familiar with, have actual knowledge of. And I think that Mr. Nixon could have placed behind him and placed behind the American people all of the speculation, all the conjecture, and uh, all of the concern that uh, the people of this country have had about the matter. He chose not to do it. And uh, some of the books that have been written, including my own book, uh, which means nothing to me financially, would not have been available. If he, had, if he had spoken to the people and had told them what the facts were, there would have been no occasion for the writing of these uh, various books that have come out. So you feel he still hadn't to told the whole story? He has not told the whole story. He insists he was not guilty of obstruction of justice. What do you say to that? Well, as you know, a grand jury investigated this entire matter, and the grand jury named him as an unindicted co-conspirator charging him with uh, obstruction of justice. The uh, Judiciary, House Judiciary Committee is sitting in impeachment, 38 people, 10 of them Republicans. And among these 10, some of his very close and dear friends and devotees who had been fighting his battles and stood up for him throughout the hearings. To a man and to a woman, they found him guilty of obstruction of justice and of having deceived the American people. From what I know about the matter, as I have uh, set out in this book of mine, I had to come to the conclusion that he was guilty of obstruction of justice. I had told his chief, his chief of staff, uh, Alexander Haig, as early as uh, late in December of 1973, that in my judgment, uh, he was criminally culpable and I strongly recommended that Hay get as fine a criminal lawyer as he could find in the country to take a look at all of the evidence, the matters that he knew about, the matters I knew about, and have him advise Haig and the president as to whether the president was not criminally guilty. He mentioned you a couple of times in his interview with Mr. Frost, and in such a way as to suggest that you left out of your book the things that might have been favorable to him. But of course, if I'd have printed all uh, that was not done now. If I had uh, included in my book all of the matters that I had available to me, we'd have had a three-volume book, and uh, most of the other matters that I could have printed would have been very, very unfavorable to him. They were reprehensible, but they were, they were not directly connected with Watergate. So I left them out. Now, he had a way, when he would talk, of getting his, getting his message across to uh, Haldeman or Ehrlichman or, or Dean or all three of them. And then after he got his message across, he would make some statement that might be a little ambivalent later on in the conversation. Well, there was no purpose in putting ambivalent material in there, but the material that was plainly spoken and the suggestions that he made and uh, the uh, solutions that he came up with himself are all in there, and uh, there was nothing left out. If uh, Mr. Nixon wants more, he may well get more. And I say that uh, feeling sorry for the man, really, because to me he's a pathetic uh, individual who could have helped himself greatly by having said more when he resigned, and as we said a few minutes ago, probably put an end to all of this. Why do you suppose there was no mention anywhere in that 90 minutes of the pardon. I never heard the word pardon mentioned. Yes, and that's a very interesting matter. I, I know that he wanted to pardon very much. I know that he uh, embraced it. He couldn't get it fast enough. Uh, 
I also know from what Senator Eastland told me that he called Senator Eastland and begged him to uh, intercede with me so that an indictment would not be returned against him. He said you were trying to put him in jail. Well, uh, I don't know where he would have wound up if the pardon hadn't been granted. I know that the grand jury wanted to indict him. And uh, I think that uh, he knows that I could have, if I'd have thought it was appropriate. I could have had him indicted at the time that Mitchell and uh, Ehrlichman and Haldeman and the rest of them were indicted. So I don't know where he draws the conclusion that I want to put him in jail. Because actually, for good reasons, and reasons that I thought were proper, I did not think that he should be indicted at the same time that the others were. But he's just uh, really fooling himself if he thinks that uh, he could not well have been indicted at that time. In fact, they wanted to indict him. The grand jury did, as is well known. The House sat in impeachment at the time, considering articles of impeachment. So you had one process going. And to indict the man in the light of that process, I thought would not have been quite fair to him. It would have prejudiced him as far as the House Judiciary Committee was concerned. And I did not think that uh, according to proper judicial process, we should be having both of those processes going on at the same time. So far from being in any sense unfair to him, I could have at that time, the grand jury was wanting to do it, and he knows that. And all I would have had to do is add my signature to it because it needed that before the indictment was valid. You, although you didn't put your signature on it, you do seem to feel that you have some ongoing responsibility to answer Mr. Nixon. I really do. Uh, it isn't uh, a matter of rejoicing talking about it. Uh, I'm weary of it. But I must say that the charter of the special prosecutor calls on him not only to make a report and uh, about his activities, but he also is given express authority to release anything to the American people at any time. And uh, I was very careful not to do so during any period of time where it could prejudice him or could hurt him in any way. But the only way I can view this matter now is that he's asking for what's going on. He's churning the entire matter up all over again. And I think it's poor judgment. Now, it may be financially gainful, and apparently is. But I think from his own standpoint, his personal standpoint, that it's unwise. I think it might be interesting to know how you chose the title of your book. The Right and the Power. During uh, the uh, days when I was having rather stern and terse exchange of correspondence with the White House, they having broken the White House, and I mean by that the President having broken the assurance he gave me that I would not have to have any question about suing him in court. If I felt like I needed to sue him, he wasn't going to raise any question about it. Well, he did raise a question about it. said I didn't have the authority to do it. But during those days, uh, there was a pretty tough exchange of correspondence. And uh, in one of those letters, I said that I had the right and the power to get these tape recordings. Uh, the publishers thought that was a pretty good title to use, and it was lifted from one of the letters that I had written to the, to the White House. It says a good bit about what you thought your responsibility was. That's right. It? There was some discussion in that interview about what was said between Nixon and Haldeman in the 18 minutes where the tape recording has been erased, but nobody raised the question about who erased it. Who erased that tape? Well, of course, Ray, if I had known who erased it, an indictment would have been returned on that. This was really one of the worst acts of obstruction of justice that uh, one can be guilty of. And you know, we not only received an 18 and a half minute gap, uh, but we also found that the belt, the dicta belt, Mr. Nixon had a habit following, despite the fact that he had his tape recording, following a telephone conversation with someone, he would then pick up his uh, dictaphone and would dictate the summary of that conversation. Now, this happened to have been a conversation with John Mitchell right after the break-in. Uh, 
And when we got that belt by subpoena, all it had on there was, now John, that was it. And the 18 and a half minute uh, gap, of course, resulted in discussions of exactly what took place. Now, Rosemary Wood said that she uh, erased about uh, four minutes or to five minutes of it. And let's assume that that's correct. Then somebody erased the rest of it because there was still too much left that uh, whoever did it wanted to suppress. At that time, I don't know of anyone who had access to these recordings except Mr. Nixon himself and Rosemary Woods, with the exception of Steve Bull carrying them at times back and forth from where they'd be locked up and the president would call for them and, and they'd be brought to him. Now, uh, so you have, have three people who had uh, access to the tapes at times. Bull, of course, was just carrying them back and forth. But you still can't return an indictment because you have at least one, maybe two people, too many, mm -hmm. involved in the situation. They never talked anything at all either about why those tapes weren't destroyed. Well, now there, I have my own views, my, my own beliefs. In the first place, the president never did think he's going to have to surrender these tapes. He was so certain of the court upholding him on executive privilege that he felt entirely secure in his own thinking about never uh, losing control or having to surrender the tapes. Well, he missed his guess. He missed it by unanimous uh, judgment of the Supreme Court. Number two, uh, I'm also rather confident that Mr. Nixon felt that the tape recordings would have a tremendous value and uh, that they could be sold for a very large sum of money, uh, much more than probably Mr. Frost paid for this uh, particular interview. Now, why he wanted to keep these tape recordings, I don't know. Uh, there were so many things on them that I would not have wanted anyone else to know about, that I would have made certain that they never fell into anyone, anyone else's hands. But um, Mr. Nixon apparently had a different view, and I think that on both counts that he thought he was going to have absolute control over them. He missed his guess there. Number two, that they were going to have a tremendous value that he could sell them for someday. And I think he's missing his guess probably there. He seemed surprised that David Frost had heard some of the tape recordings that Frost had heard. And I understood Frost to say that almost anybody could if he went to the right place. Is that true? Well, this is true. Uh, you must remember that many of them were played uh, to the House Judiciary Committee. The House Judiciary Committee released a complete set of those tapes that it had, that is the transcription of these tapes. Uh, the uh, cover-up trial had many of these tape recordings. The news media, of course, was there, and they used many of them during the trial. Didn't use some of them because some were not admissible. But um, this is how, uh, how these tape recordings got out. Of course, we had many of them. The interesting thing is, uh, brings to mind something that you asked me about earlier. What Mr. Nixon may have forgotten is that his chief, his chief of staff, and it may even have been that Mr. Nixon directed him to do it, gave me a copy of the White House transcription of March the 23rd, March 21st, excuse me which is one of the most damning of all of uh, these transcriptions. That's the one where Mr. Nixon was teaching Mr. Haldeman how to keep from telling the truth and at the same time avoid a perjury charge. Now, there can't be any argument about the correctness of that transcription. As a matter of fact, he discussed that and, uh, and defended it as the role of a defense lawyer of, uh, talking to a witness who might be asked uh, unnecessary questions by a grand jury. Well, if I were acting as a defense attorney and then uh, gave uh, that kind of counsel, I would be ashamed of myself. I would think it would be highly unethical. In fact, I even am not certain that it wouldn't amount to subordination of perjury. <coughs> he mentioned that if he had really intended to obstruct justice, he could have done it by pardoning everybody as soon as he was reelected. Is that, do uh, you think, conceivable? Well, that there were some efforts made to obtain a pardon uh, is not to be questioned because I know that that is true. Uh, 
Uh, I know that uh, there were even some very late efforts made. Uh, Haig told me that uh, Erdman had contacted Rosemary Woods in the last few days of the Nixon administration. Uh, Haldeman contacted Haig. Now, this is Haig's version to me. I don't know uh, what the reaction of the public would have been if Mr. Nixon, who himself was under fire, had undertaken to pardon these other individuals. You must remember that the only reason that I was ever appointed, and let me inject uh, this comment, when I went to Washington, I thought Mr. Nixon was innocent. I wanted to believe that he was innocent. I thought he'd been victimized by uh, members of his staff. And it was a shock to me when I found out otherwise. In fact, uh, it, it was about the worst shock that I have ever had. I couldn't believe it. But uh, I think that he was uh, conducting and carrying on with a number of these uh, people, knowing that the situation was a grave one, trying to find methods of escape from the consequences of it. It's true there was a political campaign ahead, too. But uh, I think when Mr. Nixon says he let the American people down and when he says that he's ashamed of himself, that he let his friends down, he should have gone one step further and said, I realize now, if I didn't realize then, that uh, I have been guilty of criminal conduct. Now, Ray, I'm not sure that in giving all of this by way of answer that I have fully answered the question that you asked but I thought it was appropriate to uh, let these, these facts be known. Do you have in your mind uh, a, a turning point? Is there in your concept, and you know more about it than anybody, I guess, in the country, is there any one uh, period or event in the history of this mess that you look on as the, as the thing that made it turn out the way it did? What was the key Well, the key to it really was uh, there were two things that were highly important. One of them was when we succeeded, which was a first in history, to get the courts to permit the grand jury report to go to the House Judiciary Committee because the committee would have had real difficulty in doing its work. It was way behind. It hadn't gotten off the ground. And we conceived the idea of getting this report over to them. Where we did not make any charges in it. In fact, I was very careful, and uh, I had the final say so on this report. I would not let anything accusatory be in there. And as a consequence, the court permitted it to go to the House Judiciary Committee, but it gave them the sum total of the evidence that we had assembled up to that point. We called it a road map in our office because it was just that. Now, if that had not happened, the House Judiciary Committee would have been so far behind its work, and there was no question in my mind about what the White House was playing for time. That was made pretty clear to me on several occasions. Number two, if the United States Supreme Court had not held as it did, uh, my efforts would have blown up. He mentioned the other night, really more than once, as he did all during the, the period when these events were unfolding, that his purpose was to get the whole story out and that this was the reason he asked John Dean to write a report and this was the reason he did various other things. Do you believe that there was ever a stage of, the, of this affair? Was there ever at any time a stage where he knew less than anybody else knew about the Watergate operation? I'd say about the principal factors, uh, the, uh, the main uh, phases of it, I think that he knew as much about it as anyone. He held hours and hours and hours of conversations on the subject. And uh, he, was, he was talking to Holloman, he was talking to Ehrlichman, he was talking to Dean. He was worried about Dean. At one point, he was worried that Dean had carried in a recording device and had Nixon's story, you see, and showing his involvement, showing Nixon's involvement in the cover-up. And Haldeman assured him that he didn't think that Dean had brought in a recording device. He asked if Dean didn't bring in a briefcase at one time. And Haldeman said no. And then Nixon said, well, he could have had some small device, you know, hidden somewhere. And, and uh, Haldeman said he didn't think so. Now, one thing that has not been mentioned that is very interesting, and I don't recall whether I went into the detail of it in the book or not, but... Uh, Hunt, Howard Hunt, uh, 
was talking to Charles Colson. The two of them were good friends. And uh, in a telephone conversation, Hunt let Colson know that he was getting very restive and wasn't going to wait much longer. And he was talking about hush money. And Colson and Generalitas always tried to reassure him and everything would be fine. I think he said something about our Christmas and everything else, you know. And uh, I get you, I get you loud and clear. I remember he had that and I, one reason I remember it so well, because I had Colson in my office reading this to him and saying to him, look, how can you explain your way out of this? John Dean had turned that over to us. What happened was after the conversation, Colson had it transcribed sent a copy of it to Dean because he wanted Dean to know how serious the matter was, you see. This fellow was about to blow. So uh, Dean turned this over to us. So when Colson found out that Dean had turned it over to us, then Colson came running with a copy, you know, to turn it over to us. And uh, that was a terrible conversation. I told uh, Colson so several times. It was unmistakable that they were talking about hush money, and it was unmistakable that uh, Hunt was saying, okay, you better come forward with it pretty quick or else. Now, the President and Mr. Colson talked frequently in the evening over the telephone. In fact, uh, over a period of time, they talked every night, sometimes several times. And it's difficult for me to believe. Now, I cannot, I must give you just my conclusion because I do not know this to be a fact. It's difficult for me to believe that Mr. Colson didn't report the seriousness of that to the man he was serving as counsel, Mr. Nixon. You believe that Mr. Nixon orchestrated the cover-up from the beginning, do you? Well, he participated in or orchestrating it, yes. There's no question he knew uh, very soon after. That's one reason uh, that there are erasures. That's one reason there are gaps. And with those erasures and with those gaps, is there evidence that would show that Nixon caused to be paid or knew of the payment of Hushman? Well, I have to come to the conclusion that what was furnished me uh, showed that he was aware of it. You must remember in one of the conversations, he, he said that there was, would be no problem in raising a million dollars. But now this is typical of some of the Mr. Nixon's conversations. And way down in line, you know, after quite some time, he says something about, well, you know, it would be wrong. But uh, he knew, it's bound to have known, that, that payments were being made. The lawyer who was representing Hunt was constantly in touch with uh, members of the White House about that, and he was receiving from uh, some of the fellows who had been used for that purpose, like this Ulasewicz and others, uh, receiving uh, money and packages that would be left to one place or another. What do you personally think about the system of justice that allows uh, for the punishment of some of these people on the basis they were punished on and the uh, uh, great dissimilarity between that and what happened to the higher-ups? Well, <clears throat> of course, the only higher-up that you could mention in, in connection with that would be the president, the former president himself. And I have to tell you that I have some mixed feelings about that. Uh, if I were to sit and try to determine how a trial would be held, of a former president charged uh, as he was or would be and uh, the public reaction to it plus the pub public curiosity. I see a lot of difficulties in this and I must say to you as I point out in the book I even see difficulties in giving him uh, a fair trial as he's entitled to under the Constitution. Just think of what all happened. Ninety million people listen to uh, men get up and say he's guilty. We've heard the evidence. House Judiciary Committee members. And here he resigns under pressure. And uh, so the, the one thing I do want, point I started to make a while ago that I want you really to fully understand is that the American people had a lot to do with the course of history in this matter. I would never have been appointed had it not been, as Haig said to me, matters are out of hand, they're revolutionary. They were getting such a strong feedback from uh, Congress who in turn were having to listen to the constituents that they said, you better get busy and appoint someone else and be sure it's someone that will be accepted in time. That was because of the reaction to the Cox firing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you see, a lot of these matters that came along, chapters in this history,
brought forth terrific reactions. I can't tell you, I received thousands and thousands of telegrams at a time. Then that's probably the real turning point in the thing, isn't well, it? Well, to some degree, yes. Public, public concern, yes. Pub public yes. arousal. Yes. A great many people watched the first one of these interviews. Uh, Mr. Frost is so encouraged that he's added another one. Uh, he's going to have five now instead of the original four. Do you imagine uh, that the curiosity about uh, what he has to say will linger through five episodes? Uh, I, I think it will not be uh, followed as closely as the first one. And now the announcement that they're going to come in with another one that will deal with the 18 and a half minute gap and so on, I think is probably uh, publicity designed to keep the interest alive. That would be my, uh, my analysis of it. A lot of people are making money out of, out of Watergate. Have you made any? I certainly haven't. As you know, this book that I wrote, all the proceeds went to a foundation for charitable and educational purposes. And uh, the uh, talks that I made following where honorariums were paid, they were put into the foundation. I didn't keep them, keep any of them. Our guest on this special edition of Big Two News Conference has been former Special Watergate Prosecutor Leon Jaworski.